Um, we're extremely happy to have uh, Greg Noble, who will enlighten us on the question of Japan and populism. Um, just a few things. Uh, if you have a phone, put it on vibrate uh, or turn it off. Uh, if you haven't gotten an invitation from us directly from our email list, you can put your business cards in uh, our kind of basket there. And last but not least, uh, as you know, these events are free, uh, but they're not cost-free, and we get absolutely no support from the Japanese government, unlike all other universities in Japan. So we strongly encourage you to make a donation, a large rather than a small donation. Uh, we take cash and we take a gold coins as well. Uh, so without further ado, we'll, so we'll start in two minutes. Uh, we're, we're in Japan, we try to be punctual, so 1930 exactly. But thanks again for joining us. And thank you to Professor Noble. <laughs> oh. So again, thank you for the invitation and thank you for coming. Uh, and thank Robert in particular. Um, Robert informed me that this talk should be shorter than I'd planned, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to to watch look at the flowers as I go galloping by on a horse. So please join with me as we go quickly uh, through this. What is populism? There are a lot of definitions, and this is not a purely academic talk, so I don't want to spend too much time on definition. My focus is going to be on a kind of a, dis a discursive approach, an ideological approach, so a way of thinking, a way of, of political discourse that various actors can uh, use, focusing on uh, the common people as opposed to some kind of corrupt elite. Uh, let me reverse the, so there are examples you all know of, uh, Le Pen in France, the, Brexit in the UK is a somewhat ambiguous case. Trump, I think, is a, is a clearer case. Uh, and we could talk about Hungary, we could talk about left-wing populism in Latin America. Let me talk about the elements, and I think I should have reversed these, particularly when we're talking about Japan. So let's look at number two, the second one first, anti-establishment dichotomy. So the heart of populism is setting aside a putatively pure people against a corrupt elite or a corrupt establishment. And uh, often, particularly in the US and Europe these days, that sets native populations or, or local populations against a cosmopolitan globalized elite. In other words, roughly speaking, people like you and me. We are the bad people. Uh, the second element is nativism. There's uh, a perceived sense of threat to the majority's sense of a normative order. These foreigners, these outsiders, that this establishment is going to undermine us, which leads to a cultural backlash. And finally, uh, a tendency, this is not absolute, but there's a tendency for those people who are caught up in this kind of, uh, of discourse to prefer strong leaders who don't worry too much about details like procedures and even laws, and who are willing to, to take a rather authoritarian approach. In general, we can say this is an approach that emphasizes the uh, democracy, the rule of the majority, but with very little concern for minority rights uh, and procedures. Uh, I was going to give an example of things that go on abroad. This is probably too much detail, but just very briefly. In the US case, if you ask not who voted in the general election, because that was very much a partisan election. Republican supporters voted for Trump, Democratic supporters voted for Hillary. But if you ask during the primaries, the Republican primaries, what kind of people supported Trump, it turns out that racism and hostile sexism were highly associated with support for uh, Trump compared to support for other Republican uh, candidates. And if you at look at the kind of people that voted for them, it tended not to be those who were the poorest or uh, in, uh, in areas with lots and lots of immigrants, but rather people who felt threatened, people who were worried that their region might be threatened as well. Uh, what I find interesting is the second point here, 68%, just over two thirds of, middle, of working class white voters say that the United States, the most powerful country in the world, needs to be protected from foreign influence. That's a really astonishing fact. I'm almost as astonished that 44%, not that far below half of, of college educated, white voters say that the, the same thing. And at the bottom, rather nerve-wracking uh, uh, figure here is that people that say we need a strong leader who is willing to break the rules uh, is well over half of working class white voters. Uh, again, Brexit's not exactly the same as, as Trump, but it's striking that again, who supported Brexit? Small towns with very few immigrants were much more likely to support Brexit than say London was where all the immigrants are. And so I have a few slides on the wonders of our current president. So that kind of speaks for itself. And the idea of a silent majority, 
this has a lot of women, but th there's a tendency for men to be more supportive of Trump. Not, there's a, a gender gap, although it's not all men by any means. And Trump did well in the South, not surprisingly. And I, this is, to call him a fascist, well, there's, there are all these academic debates about how we should understand fascism, which is a problem at the very beginning. I, I rather like this as a cartoon. And although I don't really take it too seriously, there are things that make you wonder. Um, it seems pretty clear that Trump does indeed uh, appeal to misogynists and Hillary haters. And if we look at France, uh, you have a populism here in the, by a, a female leader, although she's the daughter of the original founder of the movement, in the name of the people. This is kind of interesting. If you, actually, if you read this, it's a more coherent statement that you'll get out of Trump. What is at stake in this election is the continuity of France as a free nation, our existence as a people. The French have been, I love this phrase, dispossessed of their patriotism. They are suffering in silence from not being allowed to love their country, not being allowed. Somebody's not allowing them. The divide is no, here we go. The divide is no longer between the left and the right, but between the patriots and the globalists. And I think that echoes very well with what you hear in the US and other places. And her biggest fear is immigration and endless cultural conflict. An organized replacement of our population, which of course begs the question, who exactly is doing the organizing? <coughs> who, wh what, what's the email? Where do I call to, 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 talk, to investigate how it's being organized? And this is her father, Jean-Marie, and uh, I, I like that poster too, the, the way they impose uh, Algeria on France, no to Islamism. And uh, she's still, see, still putting forth Islam as the great, and Islamic immigrants as the great uh, them, the other. And if we look at the UK, not quite as populous, a little bit different as somebody was just mentioning tonight, the traditional British elite has also had very mixed feelings about the EU. So it's a more complicated case. But there's certainly some elements that sound similar. We want our country back. Um, no border, no control. This is supposed to to uh, elicit the idea of, of Dover, I presume, the cliffs of Dover. So they look like high cliffs, but now we've got an escalator for these foreigners to just come pouring in. No border, no control. And last but not least, no more mosques. So that's pretty clear. And this is, I like this poster because it shows pretty clearly the last tendency, the not worrying too much about procedures and human rights. What about Japan? Okay, so Japan, in some ways, seems vulnerable for the reasons listed there. Economic decline, demographic aging, people are certainly worried there's a threat to Japan. Uh, that's certainly uh, an issue. Um, but with some, marginal, some, some modest partial exceptions that I'll talk about later, not a lot of populism. And I will t focus through most of this talk on the limited demand for populism. There is a potential supply. And in fact, since I turned in these slides, somebody has offered uh, some more evidence in that direction, but supply, uh, supply is potentially there. There are politicians who would be willing to engage in this kind of discourse, but demand seems to be fairly limited, uh, and there are structural reasons why that may not change as much as you might think. So one thing that I find quite surprising, if you look at the a January Ipsos poll, an international poll, Japan actually is surprisingly low on nativism. So the bottom, the, the um, y-axis is nativism. So do you feel like a stranger in your own country? And the x-axis is the system is broken, yes on the left, no on the right. And Japan is surprisingly far to the southwest. So Japanese are not, so just in case you can't see it, here's the arrow. Japan is down at the bottom left. So Japan, we think Japan, foreigners often complain that Japanese are xenophobic, but if you look at this poll, yeah, it doesn't necessarily seem so. Why might that be? Uh, there are a number of firewalls against populism in Japan, I'm going to argue. And this is a kind of overview of what I'm going to do next. Basically, high levels of social integration but low levels of immigration mean that the potential threat to the majority sense of a moral order is relatively low. And that means that you have relatively little cultural backlash. There's not that much to have a backlash against. Let me mention briefly the myth of the myth of homo homogeneity. And this is partly a dip disciplinary difference. <laughs> If you ask historians and anthropologists, uh, they hate the idea of the, that Japan is homogeneous. First of all, it makes their studies uninteresting, but also they don't believe it, and for, for good reasons. And there are all these groups that, that are, you know, Japan historically was created, it just didn't come out of nowhere. Japanese were not all created Japanese 10,000, 20,000 years ago. 
And there are the Doha groups, the Ainu, Zainichi, Konkokujin, and so forth. There are lots of different minorities in Japan, and that's all true. I wouldn't deny that for a minute. But for a political scientist, the most obvious question is who votes for whom? And how can you, how can you explain who votes for whom? And in most countries, you look at religion. So in Holland, you've got Catholics and, and Protestants. In Germany, you've got Catholics and Protestants. You've got language. Obviously, in Holland, you've got the Dutch and the, sorry, in, uh, in Belgium, you've got the, uh, the split, and you've got uh, re religion and language and social class in most European countries, immigrant status. But what's really remarkable in Japan is how hard it is to do that. Explain Japanese voting in terms of geographical region, not very good. Gender gap, there's not very much of a gender gap in voting. Religion, there's one major party, I'll mention that in a minute, Komeito, of course, but otherwise, no big religious parties. And in general, it's really hard to explain Japanese voting in terms of uh, splits in, in, in uh, Japanese society. And whereas the big trend in American political studies these days is identity, more than interests or ideology, it's identity that drives voting. It's hard to do that in Japan. So let me go through the obvious. This crowd knows most of these things. Small foreign population, you all know that. The average in Europe, 10, 12 percent. The United States is about the same. Australia and Canada are a little bit, a little bit higher. If the if the existence and uh, uh, activities of foreigners are threatening, Japan has not much of a threat. Ethnicity, uh, Japanese government doesn't even collect data on ethnicity. There, it's not even a concept the Japanese government uses. And the, to the extent that there are groups, the Burakumin, Ainu, and so forth, they mostly look like Japanese and are indistinguishable on the street. Um, we could talk about this melting pot versus salad bowl, but that's not, I think, really the key. The key is that basically you don't have big ethnic uh, diversity. In, particularly for voting. And surprisingly, Japanese don't see immigration, even though they don't see immigration in a positive light, which is true, that will be what many of you expect. By the way, I find some of these numbers really interesting. Oh. Turks hate immigration. Indians and Chinese are surprisingly open. I find some of these results quite interesting. But anyway, Japan is pretty low, but and, oh, yes, and some are opposed to immigration. But they're not particularly worried about it either. So this, again, reflects the fact that it's so small. This is a really striking figure. It, it, do you agree with this statement, there are too many immigrants in our country? In Turkey, 92%, I think it is there. Uh, the US is kind of in the middle, 40, uh, 49%, uh, 48%, and Japan is by far the lowest. So it's not a big problem at, at the current levels. And many of them, again, are physically indistinguishable. Some are. You can certainly see South Asians and other physically, uh, obviously, non-Japanese people. But many of them, most of them, are not. If we look at language, I won't belabor this. But if you, look, if you go to Quebec, or Taiwan, or Ireland, or Barcelona, there, California, there are big debates about what we should do about uh, minority languages in the schools. When was the last time you heard a debate about that in Japan? It's not an issue. The only question is, how can we get foreigners to speak Japanese better, but nobody's asking to teach other languages in the schools. This is probably too long. My main point here is that Japan, unlike Europe or the United States, does not have an historical conflict with Islam. So Islam is not automatically accepted as an enemy or at least a longtime rival. The way it is in most Western countries, uh, religion in Japan tends to be relatively syncretic. It is true, though, at the bottom, it is true that when Japanese meet more ideological religions, whether foreign or domestic, like Om Shinrikyo or perhaps Islam, when they come up with more dogmatic versions, that tends to make most Japanese rather nervous. But in general, Japan itself overall is not all that exclusive. This is, everybody in this audience probably knows this, but nowadays, this is the typical wedding, but you get a lot of people who also do this. I, I'm not an expert on weddings, but I understand that this is beginning to decrease somewhat. It used to, well, there's a whole history that I don't know that well, but for a while, this was the norm. You do both. I believe, in question and answer, if anybody's interested, you could tell me, but I believe this is decreasing somewhat. But it notice that it's the Western style that's prevailing, it's the Japanese style that's, that's decreasing, I believe. This is kind of interesting. Um, is there a sense of being a stranger in your own country? Do you feel like there are foreigners all over the place? If I could be forgiven a small personal example. My mother and father tell me there are a lot of, there's all this Spanish in the, in the grocery store. Oh, really? Yeah, there, it's, you, hear, you hear foreign language everywhere you go. It's all over the place. It's very unsettling. OK. Are the goods all marked in English? Well, yeah, yeah. And the tellers still all speak English? Well, yeah, of course, yeah. And has anybody been rude to you? No. But they're all speaking Spanish all the time. 
That was hard for me to understand. This is my own mother. It's hard for me to understand. But in Japan, at any rate, you don't have much of that. And as far as I can tell, with one or two exceptions, there has not been a public outcry or a lot of public opposition to building mosques in uh, Japan, although supposedly there are a lot of police around. There are spies all over the place. This very briefly, so if we talk about social integration, social homogeneity, the crime rate is very low in Japan, as you all know, although it's also low in a lot of East Asian countries. Uh, the incidence of crime is, is falling. Serious crime is at the bottom. This is not corrected for population growth. So basically, if you compare the immediate aftermath of the war, uh, not so much 1945, if you look at, say, 1950, Showa Nijigonen, to today, there were more crimes in Japan in 1945, 1950, with a lot fewer people than there are today. The idea that, that there's terrible crime wave is just really crazy. Surprisingly, though, or maybe interestingly, the fear of crime does seem to be in increasing. So I'm not experiencing crime, but you never know. It's going to be crime. And although foreigner crime in reality is very low, uh, it does, there does seem to be some increase. And any increase could set off more tensions. That's a potential thing to watch for. And we have our beloved former governor who can make all kinds of kind comments about the Chinese. Um, you might say, but aren't there quarter, foreigner quotas in sports? Doesn't that show a sense of uh, unease that the Japanese majority is under threat? And I think to some extent in the case of Samoa, that, that's somewhat true. But how true is it and how bad is it? I think overall you'd say not so bad. Here are the details about how the timing and, and what sort of uh, constraints have been placed. If you look at baseball, I think is an interesting variation. There are strict limits, four foreigners per 25-man roster. But if you graduate from a four-year Japanese university, you're treated as Japanese. So there's clearly a different conception, not ethnicity or birth, but culture. If, you're Japan, if you act like a Japanese, we'll accept you as Japanese. So even though these are both somewhat exclusionary, they do show a feeling that we can't compete on our own, there's a pretty big difference. Sumo is a little more extreme. And even so, so there, it's certainly clear that when Kiseno Sato became a Yokozuna, that people were happy about that. Lots of people were happy about that. And that does show a sense of, of renewal of ethnic pride, so to speak. But uh, oh, Hakuho is still very popular, uh, the, the sort of all-time leading champion now these days. And most Samoa wrestlers, in fact, marry Japanese women, become Japanese citizens, and even if they look different. So, Koto is, uh, is very foreign looking, and yet he married a Japanese woman. He just established his own stable. As long as he does everything the Japanese way, he'll be OK. Now, if he, if he says, maybe we should do something different, I predict he's going to have problems. But as long as he does it exactly the Japanese way, he can look like that, and it's OK. And if you look Japanese, you don't have to, if, if, you're, if you win, you don't have to look Japanese. <laughs> uh, Abdul Hakim Sani Brown on the left, he does speak Japanese. He was raised here. He speaks perfect Japanese, although he's now going to the University of Florida, I think, for his training. Uh, Osaka Naomi, I think, is a more interesting example. <laughs> she tried to conduct an interview in Japanese, and it was just completely hopeless. But the one word she knew how to say is, gachitai. <laughs> She's a pretty good tennis player, too. But, but if you watch NHK, they treat her completely as Japanese, even though in, in any cultural sense, she's not Japanese. And, and obviously, she's biracial. Uh, just to summarizing this, it's of course true that Japan, Japanese are not all the same. There's an historical process of, of bringing people together, and there are differences in Japan. All that's true. But if you're trying to understand politics or the basis of social cleavage and possible support for populism, Japan, in fact, is pretty homogeneous. What if we look at economics, media, and history? If you look, I will argue that economics is not the main source. Economic insecurity or perceived economic insecurity is not the main source of support for populism. But it's, it's a factor. But most Japanese think they gain from international trade. That's really different from the US, the UK, Australia, and so forth. Uh, inequality is relatively low. And crucially, rural areas are well represented politically. OK, so Japan has few natural resources, a shrinking population. It needs to import oil. And it's, it's a crucial difference that whereas the US and the UK have been running, and Australia have all been running huge deficits for 40, 50 years, Japan has been running trade surpluses almost, not quite the whole time, almost the whole time. Inward foreign investment is limited, and there's calls for it to increase. But if we look down there at the bottom, if Chinese investment increases, that will create more tension. I'm pretty sure of that. And already in Europe, there's a lot of un unease about increasing Chinese investment. The idea that it's, uh, that it's not uh, symmetrical, we can't invest in Chinese companies as easily as they can invest in our companies. That argument is not always entirely true, actually. Foreigners own a lot of companies in China. There's a lot of foreign investment. But it is true that there are some Chinese uh, uh, restrictions. And the fear that Chinese companies will buy up uh, high-tech companies is really becoming quite serious in Germany. And that could happen in Japan. 
And of course, there's a much greater uh, historical, cultural, and geopolitical struggle between China and Japan. So that is worth watching. But overall, it's very different from the US and Japan. And this is just a graph to show you uh, the difference and uh, the fact that Japan has been running pretty much consistent trade uh, and current account uh, surpluses. And it, this is kind of obvious, but it's worth mentioning. Trade uh, unemployment is low. Uh, and this is including Seishain, so, so regular employees, and for the first time, has gone over. There's basically one job opening for every job, one job applicant, even for so-called regular jobs. Japanese youth unemployment, which was a little bit high at the, at the, during the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the, the worst of the, of the early 2000s, there was a period where things were a little bit bad. But when you look at Spain, Italy, France, Greece, I didn't even put Greece up there. Japan is just in a different world. Well, what's the definition of youth? Uh, what is the definition of youth? That's, yeah. I don't remember for this one. I'll, I'll double check, but it's, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely under 30. Probably under 25 sounds right. Now this is a graph, either the graph or the, the verbal reporting of this is very common. Everybody in Japan hears this. More and more people are, having, are subject to irregular or non-regular employment. Everybody knows this story in Japan. Everybody, all adults anyway. But it's misleading. So if we look at this graph, the yellow part, Hiseki, non-regular or irregular, that is, that is certainly increased. That's true. And that's why this graph is going up, the ratio. So the absolute numbers have gone up. That means the ratio has gone up. But look at the blue. From the mid-2000s to today, this has varied almost not at all. Permanent employment jobs, regular jobs, are not decreasing. And if you consider that the working age population is steadily decreasing in Japan, again, if you corrected for that, it's remarkable how steady permanent employment has been. So it's not that people who used to have permanent employment jobs are being replaced by people who don't have them. It's that there are new additions to the workforce. It's not replacement, but addition. Who, is, who are those added figures? A lot of them is women who might not have worked before. There's a, we can have a discussion about what is voluntary. Are women working because they want to or because they have to? How do we understand that? That's a tricky debate or discussion. We can get into that if you're interested. But they're not the only ones. If you look at 30, 25, 30 years ago, most, certainly most men and, and almost all women didn't go to four-year colleges. They went out of high school and went to regular jobs. They were counted as regular. Nowadays, they go to college, and what do they do? They work part-time. So a lot of people who are irregular are actually college students with part-time jobs. So the social significance of that is really quite different from people who, don't, who are only working a part-time or irregular job. This is something almost nobody ever talks about. Uh, Self-employment has steadily declined in Japan, so these people are now becoming employees. But they were not well treated before. It's not like these people had permanent good jobs before. They were self-employed and subject to a lot of, of uh, instability, and a lot of them obviously have been forced out of that sector. By the way, in Jap Japanese you say jie gyosha. This is more like entrepreneurs. In English we call that employed. In Japan we actually use different words, which is a bit confusing if you're not used to it. So these are, are, we would call them employees, but in Japan they're not called employees. They were self jiegyosha, and now they've, uh, they've become, uh, well, many of them retired, but others have become uh, uh, permanent, uh, uh, per temporary or permanent employees, a lot of them temporary. And this is uh, the social side. I wish this graph went back further. I don't have the full graph, and we don't have good data, so the data are not great. I have some data for Kanto, which go back a little bit further. But the basic idea is that before this, when the economy was good, support for permanent or regular employment went down. It means you sell your life to the company, slow promotion, boring. People didn't love regular employment. They didn't love the permanent employment system. Support went down. But then during that period we saw before, when the economy was not so great, people got more nervous. My interpretation is it's not great. Permanent employment, regular employment is not great. It has all the problems people talk about, but it's a hell of a lot better than the alternatives. And so we see support for, for uh, permanent employment is at an all-time high, a very, very high. There's a tendency to prefer security. And this one surprised me a bit, a sense of unity in the workplace. So for all those who want uh, merit wages and merit wage increases and higher mobility and more competition, that's not what most people in the Japanese working place want. And surprisingly, this also surprised me, 76% supported uh, seniority wages. So think of an, an ideal typical family. The father still has a permanent job with a regular wage. 
The mom was once just a housewife. Now she works part time after work. Whether she does that voluntarily or involuntarily, we can debate about. That's rather tricky. May or not be by choice. But that's what she's doing. And she's still married to a guy who's still got a permanent job, who's paying the mortgage. Grandpa had to retire early, and he's not very, making very much money. That's kind of a pain. It's not very pleasant to sort of end your career on a down note. So it's not that everybody loves this system. The son has graduated from high school or college. He's struggling as a temp worker, no security, low wages. But on balance, by his late 20s or early 30s, he will find a permanent job. 85 percent find a permanent job, so-called seiki, uh, irregular job. And the hypothetical daughter in this family is working part-time while in university, so she's counted as an irregular worker. But in fact, she's going to university, living at home. Life's not that terrible. That is not the picture of an extremely unstable, uh, worried household. So this just summarizes all that. This stability undermines the appeal of populism. What about inequality? This is a bit tricky. We have this image of Japan as being highly egalitarian. And the evidence is a bit Again, the data are not actually perfect, not as good as we would like. But they seem to suggest that Japan was never as equal as people claimed. It was higher, less equal than Sweden and uh, Germany, though, though more equal than the UK and at the top there, the US. And if you look at that graph, uh, the, the reason there are two lines is it's, a, it's correcting for uh, demography. So basically, the population is aging, and that's changing things a bit. But the, the graphs don't diverge too much. Those seem to suggest that inequality has increased, but not dramatically so, and Japan is not as bad as the UK uh, and the US. And if we look at inequality at work, I was a little surprised that Japan isn't even lower, but certainly compared to the US, there's just a gigantic difference at how much the president of your company is a millionaire while you're working for a pittance. That's common in the US, not in Japan. Finally, we don't have a big cultural backlash against change in Japan because in many areas there hasn't been that much change. Now you can say that's a good thing or a bad thing. Many people in this room may not have a, the same view of that. But for better or for worse, a lot of things haven't changed all that much. So if you're a conservative in the countryside, an older, less educated male in the countryside, a classic supporter of populism, there's not as much to, to have a backlash against. The welfare state in Japan is relatively uh, stingy. And so foreigners are not being treated particularly well, because nobody in Japan is being treated particularly well. You may say that's a bad thing. What about single mothers? A lot of people worry about that. And it is not the case that Japanese never complain that welfare goes to foreigners. Even in Japan, you do hear that complaint. But compared to the US, and especially to Europe, it's a less of a complaint, because it's not like they're handing out money uh, hand over fist. So it's relatively resistant to populist attacks. I didn't mention the size of the government and the size of the bureaucracy. Again, you do hear people saying, we've got too many bureaucrats that aren't doing anything useful. We need a smaller, leaner state. But if you actually look at the data, the bureaucracy in Japan is already very small. And people who actually work in the government or work in policy know that. So there's a limit to how, how much you can go on that particular line of complaint, although people like Hashimoto have tried to do that. If we look at the media, so far at least, they're not terribly polarized. And this is really different from the US. It is true that the internet and social media are gaining, but most people still get their news from TV. And similarly, newspapers are declining in Japan steadily, but much more slowly than elsewhere. And Japanese still read newspapers. It's kind of amazing. Uh, in general, I think the tradition of, of deference is still pretty strong. The question for me is whether this is cause or effect. Is it because Japan is not as polarized that the media are able to sustain themselves better, or as Tanikuchi Masaki has argued, partly because the media them are, are sustaining themselves, people are not breaking up into groups, reading different things, and becoming more and more polarized by the feedback effect. It's probably some of both. Uh, there, now, I've argued that there's not a lot of populism in Japan, but there are certainly examples. And let's take just a very quick look at three examples. But what's striking to me is that all these, all these basically turned out to be temporary. There was a problem. People complained. Something happened. And the problem more, problem more or less solved itself. So in the early 2000s, there was a perception of a, of a crime wave, which in fact was not true. But there was a perception. We can go into that if you're interested. There was a movement partly uh, stimulated by what had gone on abroad by families, of, of vic victims of crimes and their families to strengthen penalties. And this fit into this pattern where you had liberal elites who were, who were coddling criminals, and we, the pure people, were being hurt. So it fits into this pattern of trying to have a, the populace against the elite uh, and creating an enemy. But fairly quickly, uh, they did stiffen prison terms, and there was some response to this, and then it kind of died away in the mid-2000s. 
If you look at the Yutori Kyoiku of the early, 19, uh, the early 2000s, there was a perception that uh, academics and pointy-eared types were, were getting soft, and Japan was suffering as a result of that. We've got to do something. The political system responded fairly quickly. There was a backlash, a reversal, and you don't hear very much about this debate in Japan. We're kind of back to the status quo as it's been for 100 years. Uh, in the mid-2000s, we also had an upsurge of anti-Korean uh, and anti-Chinese hate speech. The legislation that was passed was, was widely seen as too weak, but in fact, it's been fairly successful. You don't hear very much about hate speech this much, uh, much these days. So there have been some examples, but in each case, the political system was somewhat responsive, and it kind of petered out before very long. So we have an, I'm, I'm gonna go over this rather quickly. There's, this is the supply side. There's, there are certainly people who would be happy to, to try to appeal to a large group and call that the good guys and focus on some bad people and make them the rhetorical uh, subject of their attack. Um, but by and large, it hasn't gone all that far. The former governor of Tokyo, Ishihara Shintaro, is certainly an example. And we could look at uh, Hashimoto Taro, uh, Toru, Toru, but he was a bureaucrat basher. One of the interesting questions is, is here, more neoliberal than populist. Some people have argued that populism and neoliberal can act, neoliberalism can actually go fairly well together. I'm skeptical about that, particularly in the Japanese case. Uh, we could talk more about that. In the Latin American case, where there was a strong sense that there was an ingrained uh, oligarchy that was in, in bed with the government that was hurting the vast majority of the population, that was somewhat effective for a while. There's since been a backlash against that. But that is, seems to, I, I think that's less likely in Japan. We could talk about Koizumi and the postal election and all that. That's an interesting subject, but I'm somewhat skeptical. Um, in general, Hashimoto wanted to subject his constituents, not just bad people, not just the, the, the evil elite establishment, but he wanted the, the actual population to be subjected more to market discipline. That's not a typical uh, populist way of, of approaching things. And then, of course, we've got our, uh, our governor. And again, somewhat neoliberal, rather ambiguous on immigrants. More information seems to be coming out from her. I mean, she said different things at different times. I've asked political scientists, what does Koike really believe? And the answer is, she's an opportunist. She doesn't really believe anything. She's an, op she's an, ideal, an, op uh, an ambitious politician. But what kind of image is she trying to put out? And I think she's put out a lot of different things, many of them quite conservative, but other times she's kind of played that down. And even the conservative elements are not po necessarily populist elements. But what's neoliberal? So basically emphasizing the necessity to slim down the government and, and, and apply more market discipline. So if you look at Hashimoto in particular, in the, so he does oppose what you can call the elite establishment, bureaucrats, unions, and the Asahi Shimbun. But his policy views are actually pretty, pretty eclectic. So if you think in terms of this, this discourse of the good, the pure people versus the corrupt establishment or elite, he's not all that consistent about that. Uh, and he practically got into a fight with uh, one of the, 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 the was the so-called Sakurai Makoto uh, about immigration. And e even more important for my purposes, his party did succeed for a while, and then its own internal contradictions more or less blew it up. What about Koike? Um, so she's, her first, she's appealing to the average Japanese. This does fit a kind of a populist rhetoric. Those corrupt elites, people like Mori, People like the insiders in Tokyo, they, they got this idea for an incredibly expensive uh, uh, stadium, and that was a stupid idea. The Olympics are going to cost too much. I'm going to save you money. This is somewhat consistent with the kind of populist way uh, of putting things. But in other areas, it's not as clear. And for me, the really interesting question is, how long is her new so-called party of hope going to last? And notice that rather than um, talking about uh, uh, sort of cutting back on s s state, uh, payments to foreigners or whatever, the current thing they're saying is let's spend more money on education, let's spend more money on uh, free university education. We could talk about what that might imply for the university sector in Japan, by the way. But um, it's not so much populist as general purpose pandering, not so much setting up an enemy, but just saying I'm going to buy off all your votes. What about Abe? He is certainly a hardcore reactionary nationalist, and in some ways he does fit a little bit more closely to this, to this kind of rhetoric. In particular, he does see this idea that Japan was somehow guilty as a threat to his idea of the normative order of most Japanese people. So in that sense, he fits this idea of, 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 of uh, populism. He wants to revise the Constitution, uh, rather uh, heavy-handed in the way he wants to enforce uh, 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 respect for Japanese norms, uh, he attacks liberal elites. At times, he sounds a little bit heavy-handed. He came in power because uh, the, the Dachi issue, and nowadays, of course, he, he assails the Chinese Navy. 
Uh, he's quite conservative. So he's a conservative, even arguably reactionary. He's a nationalist. Those are all true. But he's a, it's, again, it's a socially conservative party. It's not going to elicit a big backlash. In addition, he's still pretty different for Trump or Le Pen. Let's go through some of the elements. He's himself, you can't get very much more elite than him. So he can't really as, as, attack the elite establishment all that easily. In general, this is a bit tricky, but generally speaking, he doesn't demonize his enemies. Carl Schmitt, the famous uh, German uh, uh, legal scholar of the, of the uh, uh, early 1920s, uh, would have said the focus is on who the enemy is. And, and by and large, he doesn't demonize his enemies. He certainly doesn't denigrate expert knowledge. Donald Trump could l learn a little bit from him. He doesn't hint at sympathy for violence. He's not Duterte. Uh, he seeks, this is really important, he seeks international cooperation, the US alliance obviously, but also the UN and the TPP and the Paris Accord. That's not what most populists do. They tend to emphasize the local pure populace as opposed to those, those cos sorry, cosmopolitan elites. Uh, his stance on women is somewhat uh, ambiguous. His stance on immigration is also somewhat ambiguous. Basically, he says he's a, opposed to immigration but in favor of bringing in jinzai. But it turns out jinzai, uh, people of talent, uh, can be defined different ways. You can play games with the skill categories in the uh, min justice ministry. There are ways to bring in more people. One of them is to bring in more foreign students. In Australia and the US and Canada and Britain, Teaching foreign students is a business, and it's an export industry, and it's pretty profitable. And in Japan, we pay them to come here because the business sector wants to bring them in because that's a way of, in effect, increasing immigration, but doing on terms that Japanese people are more comfortable with. So basically, people should come, learn Japanese, become socialized, decide they like Japan, and then we'll take them in. They shouldn't just come here to work and, and then leave. Actually, I think if he had his druthers, I think uh, Abe would be happy to be uh, a reactionary populist. But the US alliance doesn't allow it. The international system doesn't allow it. And I don't think he sees a huge market for, for, for xenophobia. There are also, and this is now we're getting to something that's close to the current election. Well, so far, memories of wartime populism and repression, particularly on the left, but in widespread of the Japanese population, have, have tended to work against this creating an enemy's approach of populism. The interesting question is whether uh, it's true that since the end of the Cold War, leftist parties and labor unions have been greatly weakened. When Abe, so far, when Abe said, I want to revise the Constitution, the more he talks about it and the more specific he gets, the more opposition to it goes up. The populace does not seem hell-bent for, for leather to revise Article 9, for example. And um, he, you can question whether his, he respects process and uh, restraints on government. That's a bit of, a, of an issue. But the populace does not seem to be particularly anxious to do that either. And again, as I mentioned with this anti-hate uh, legislation, it was weak, but it was actually fairly uh, effective. The question is, what does the current election, uh, what does the current election imply? And one possibility, a little bit separate from what I'm talking about today, is that this is going to be the final destruction of the left. And that could fundamentally change pop Japanese popular, uh, politics. So I'm assuming here that what we've seen so far doesn't dramatically change, that that sense of wariness about radical change, the sense of supporting the Constitution remains fairly widespread in Japan. It may or may not. We'll see. This, this election will have a lot to tell us about that. But if it does, that will, again, constrain the ability, even of those who would like to do it, to restrain the ability to appeal to, uh, to uh, populism. So here's my wild card scenarios. What might push Japanese into a, a, a greater willingness to sort of create enemies and have a us versus them kind of enemy, uh, enemies approach? Perceived abandonment by the US is certainly one of them. If you feel threatened, that would threaten the perceived moral order of the majority of Japanese people. And here are some possible uh, scenarios. Um, so far, I think, though, the, the supply is there. There are people who are willing to supply it, but there seems to be a limited Japan a demand for populism in Japanese society. Social integration is high. The economy is fairly stable. And there are limited inroads of progressivism. All those things are likely to limit the demand for uh, populism. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Um, and now we have our Q&A session. So the way to proceed is raise your hand, or two hands. Uh, Professor Noble will re recognize you, and then you can either walk to the mic. The advantage is that your voice will be better heard and will be recorded. If for some reason you wish to remain anonymous, uh, you can ask a question from, the, from where you're sitting, and then you will not be video recorded. 
So I'll let you pick the questioners. I think Adam, I saw you first. You saw that order, you three. Greg, those are fantastic talk. My name is Adam Liff. I teach at Indiana University in the United States, and I'm currently based in Tokyo through December at the University of Tokyo with Greg at the Institute of Social Science. Um, this was fantastic. One word that I didn't hear you mention was agriculture and farming. When we think about rough analogs in other countries, you know, I think back to West Virginia, the United States, coal country, uh, that's something that is more of an identity issue than an economic issue when you factor in the number of people who are actually involved in that as their primary source of income. In Japan, the numbers of Japanese farmers declined precipitously over the last few decades, but still far greater in number as a percentage of the population than, say, coal miners. But this hasn't really emerged as a wedge issue, as an identity issue in Japan in the way that arguably has to some degree in the past. When you think about some opposition to, among other things, TPP, it came from the agricultural sector. I was just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and why it is that that hasn't emerged as an issue that we might have expected it to otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the usual preface, I am not an expert on probably every topic you're going to ask me enough about, <laughs> starting with agriculture. I'm not an expert on agriculture. So for what it's worth, here's my answer. First of all, there's a party in Japan which is quite sensitive to the demands of farmers. It's called the Liberal Democratic Party, and it's been running Japan most of the post-war period. So if you're a farmer, you don't feel like nobody's listening to you. You don't have the alternation of parties, one of which you think hates you, the other of which is kind of ambiguous. You don't have that in Japan. Second, and again, I'm, I'm, not an I'm not an expert on, on agriculture, and I'm not an anthropologist, but what I read and what I think is pretty true is that even farmers themselves know the game is up. Farmers in Japan are really old. They know their children are not going to take over the farm. So it's kind of a game to, to, to sort of get through to the end game. But most of them are not really expecting that they can hang on, that their children will, will take over for them. And I think that's a big factor. The LDP also, I think in recent years, has done a better job of giving them the message that we will protect you, but you're going to have to gradually make concessions. And I think they may have had a fairly decent balance of that. And so I think there's, again, why don't you have a backlash? Because you don't have much of an impetus uh, in the first place. Whereas in the US, there's a sense that if it weren't for these bad people, we'd be OK. Coal miners believe it weren't for, if it weren't for Democrats, coal would be OK. That's, of course, an absolute fantasy. The market is going completely against coal. But, and the majority of the population is, in fact, supportive of environmental regulations. The Republicans may not want to believe it, but look at the polls. The ma large majority of Americans support uh, uh, environmental regulations, but it's not crazy for someone to think the Democrats are my enemy, defeat the Democrats, we'll be in much better shape. In Japan, that's not going to happen. So the simple answer is this is a system that's been very favorable to the countryside, so you have less reaction from the countryside. And you get who's, who's, who are the closer, closest analogs to five this we see here? Ishihara, Hashimoto, Koike. Who are they? The governors of the two biggest cities. Because we're the ones that have, we, I'm a resident, not a citizen, have been relatively, relatively uh, dist. Um, yeah. yeah, from here. Um, you know, I appreciate your quick snapshot, but your methodology, and you know, when you say that most Japanese read the newspapers, then uh, in that sense, you know, I wonder, you know, because you're in Tokyo right now here, so maybe you focus on the people in Tokyo rather than the countryside and the different cities. You know, how you use the data? Very simply, I read Taniguchi Masaki's book. That's my data. Uh, so this is a leading social scientist at the University of Tokyo who has a book, recent book out on media and politics in Japan, and that's what he says. And I respect Taniguchi-san, so I think he's probably right. Uh, and if you just look at the numbers for Asahi or, or Yomiuri, uh, they're still very strong. It is true that they're declining, and Yomi, uh, Asahi in particular is declining. By the way, why Asahi is declining is an interesting question. Is it because Japan is becoming more conservative, or is it because they don't like longer newspapers? Because what strike we usually say Asahi is liberal, Yomiuri is conservative. But the other thing you notice is read the articles. Asahi is long. All the other newspapers are much shorter, and it may be partly a shift among younger people away from such such detailed kind of coverage. As much as or that's just a hypothesis. My evidence for that is I'm guessing, but my evidence for the first one is I cite Taniguchi Masaki. I mentioned this to you earlier, but I'm interested in um, a more progressive form of populism. Um, 
So your definitions suggest that nativism has to be an essential element of the definition of populism. So no. Would you, okay, so you, would you accept that someone like Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn, pro-demos in Spain could be populist movements? Yes. And is there a space perhaps, especially among the youth in Japan, for a more progressive form of populism, emphasizing environmentalism, peace, perhaps also this is the group of people who may feel more economically insecure going forward? That's a good question. My guess is not really. Um, why do I think that? One thing is the labor market. The Japanese labor market is contracting. The, the, uh, the demo demographically, the, num the people of, of age 15 to 64 is, is decreasing. The Tankan just came out, the Bank of Japan's short the survey of business activities, and it's really good, given Japan's very low expectations, of course, <laughs> but it's very good. But the long-term trend is basically the baby boomers, the, the Dankan no Sedai, are retiring, and that's creating a much stronger labor market. Now, there's a debate. Uh, if I could do a little Tikosen Den for a journal for which I'm the editor of um, uh, editor-in-chief, we had a really good piece looking at the evolution of uh, the dual or, or more or less dual labor market in Japan by Andrew Gordon of Harvard. And he argues that when you saw strong labor markets in the 1920s and the 1960s, you also had strong labor movements. So politics and economics came together. Today, the labor market is strongly improving, but you don't have a strong political movement to go along with it. So we will see. So far, though, and wages have not gone up a lot in Japan. That's certainly true. But companies are making a lot of money. If you look at the, at the graphs, Japanese companies were always famous for low profitability. And profitability is an all-time high now, uh, at least in the last 40, 50 years. Uh, and so far, that money has not gone to workers. But if the labor market remains as tight as it is now, or as seems to be the case, gets constantly tighter, then probably wages will start to go up. So I, I mean, I teach a university. There was a period. If you, if you graduated from university in Japan in 2000, I forget the exact years, 2003, 2004, I think it was, things were pretty bad. People were really nervous. And as you know, as you're well aware, in Japan, you don't have a, a, an infinite number of chances. If you don't get that first job, then you know, you're, you're likely to get shut out. And research, I don't know for the Japan, but research in the US suggests that people who graduate from college in years of bad labor markets suffer a lifetime penalty, a big lifetime penalty. And I, I would assume that's as great in Japan, if not greater. So from the labor market perspective, I'm kind of skeptical. Um, if, if you want a small n, n equals 1, I'm talking to my son who went to high school in Japan, he just thought, you study politics, but you don't understand what my classmates are. Nobody's in the least political. It's not at all political. Now, that's undoubtedly a generalization and a simplification, but it doesn't seem crazy. Japanese youth don't strike me as highly politicized. And I don't, again, they may not have a, a permanent employment job today. They may not even get one immediately out of school, but dad still has one. And in the long run, they'll probably get one, at least for the boys. Now, the girls may be different, particularly the more ambitious ones. That's another interesting set of questions. But I guess I'm reluctant to be as optimistic as you sound, if that's the right word, for now, anyway. Anybody else? Dan? Greg, I want, I want to pick up your, your wild card scenarios there, because um, maybe they're not that wild. <laughs> the, the, if you look at, in Europe at the thriving populist movements in Europe or in the United States, when we have had, of course, uh, terrorist attacks on a, uh, over a long period of time, which have created a sense of, of deep insecurity, but are then coupled with uh, the immigration issues. Uh, I mean, I think the, the immigration issues are much more potent because they're uh, linked to uh, terrorism. Uh, at, at the same time that the sense of sort of global order uh, was, was in question. So, we haven't had that here, for the most part, but we could. Now, I don't know about the terrorist part, but I think the, but the, even that's every, anything's possible in the world we live in. So, but the, particularly the, the, you know, we do, however, see the sort of the Asian end of the global system, the post-war system, under considerable stress. And I wonder if you see in that the potential seeds or a little or evidence of, of how those uh, uh, how, you know the perception of that uh, is beginning to maybe create the, uh, the foundation at some point in the future for the kind of thing you're talking about. I'm thinking about uh, sort of abandonment fears, talk of going nuclear, uh, you know, 
that, that kind of sort of uh, echoes of nationalism, things we've seen, which are, I think, to some degree, reflections of the fear of abandonment. So can you see in that the kind of roots of a populism that could emerge, so we can, where we can already see some evidence of it? Excellent question. And you and Adam are better placed to answer it than I am. But since I'm standing here, I'll do my best. I think we need to make a distinction between nationalist and even militarist and populist. So worries about Chinese or North Korean attacks or just threats certainly stimulate a, a more conservative move. But that's not necessarily populist. I do think if, you, you think if you go back to Carl Schmitt, creating enemies, deliberately trying to heighten conflict, then I think the obvious conflict is not within Japan. It's Japan versus the outside world. And it's Japan versus China and Korea, to put it bluntly. And to some extent, that seems to be happening. I'm particularly struck, again, not my expertise, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I've talked to a number of Japanese who essentially say China is terrible, but China is very big, and there's not much we can do about it. And so we have to sort of put up with it as best we can and, and sort of do what we can. But those damn Koreans, we don't have to put up with that crap. <laughs> Now, from my perspective, China is a dictatorship of the Communist Party. Korea is a, is a democracy, an imperfect democracy, but so is Japan, so is every country. And so to treat the two as the same, and in some ways to treat Korea worse, seems weird to me. But if you think of this logic, basically, the, the easiest thing is to say, what about in Hongjin? The, the easiest sort of cleavage is not within Japan, it's Japan versus the rest of the world. But that's not necessarily populist. What would be populist is if you start attacking, for example, left-wing University of Tokyo professors who sympathize with Koreans and outsiders and start saying, you are the globalist, you are the cosmopolitanist, you are the evil elite that is, is hurting the Japanese people, that would be populist. Is that going to happen? To some extent, probably will. Is it going to become a, a big deal? Time will tell. I'm, I'm looking at this election with more interest than any in a long time. This is a really interesting election. Because it's going to see, you can think of, of Nakasone in the 80s and, and essentially destroying the biggest public sector unions. And then you look at, um, uh, at uh, Koizumi and the, basically when North Korea admit that they admitted that they had stolen Japanese citizens and what that did to the left. It destroyed the Socialist Party. Sort of organizationally and then ideologically, the, the, the hardcore left was destroyed. But you still had this general sense and you still have the communists. Probably the communists will do well in this election, I suspect. We've got people here who know more than I do, but I suspect they will do pretty well which in a way may be a problem in, in dividing the left, but at least they will probably do pretty well. But will the right be able to essentially sort of McCarthyize the left in Japan? Is that going to happen? I don't know. I kind of think not. But if it does, that would be populist. When we say, we, speaking on behalf of the pure majority, are, are going to stop this terrible depredation against our interests by you, you effete liberals who sympathize with those goddamn foreigners, that's populism. Will that happen? We'll see. Thanks for the really uh, interesting talk. I think my main takeaway is kind of like in the short term, nothing really exciting seems to be happening. Uh, but if we think a bit longer, say in the, the coming decades, and as Japan continues to age and the population continues to decrease, uh, and you know, if it doesn't sort of, you know, start creating enough robots sort of make up for that, might you not have a sort of double whammy where you've got, you know, loads of racist old people and then, you know, increasing amounts of immigrants that need to be brought in to keep the economy sort of sustainable at any base right. level. Uh, so what do you reckon the, like, slightly longer term prospects are and what stresses the sort of depopulation and aging might bring to uh, the current situation? Good social science involves predictions, which allow us to tell whether or not our hypotheses were correct. <laughs> Smart social scientists never get predictions because they could be proven wrong. <laughs> so in that spirit, I will, I'm very nervous to hear your question because I really don't know. My gut instinct is that immigration is not going to increase that much. And Japanese will accept a slow decline. And there are a number of reasons for that. One, one problem for Japan is Abe and, and the Keidanren and so forth want jinzai. But if you take that seriously, at the high end, how many high end people want to come to Japan? Jap Japanese tend to think we're a rich country, we're a, a nice country, which is true. It's a safe, well organized, clean country, all of which is true. Therefore, and lots of foreigners want to come here, that's true. Therefore, high level people want to come here, but that's not the same thing. So for example, pop quiz, 
who does all the great software in the, in the world these days? Well, the Americans, but also the Indians. IBM now has more employees in India than it does in the United States. India's great software power. That's true. OK, how many Indians are there in, the, in Japan? 10,000 in Tokyo. 10,000 Tokyo, is that what it is? It's about 30,000 in the whole country. Pop quiz number two. Are there more Indians, 1.4 billion people, or more Nepalese? Six, whatever it is, 50 or 60 million, 40 or 50 or whatever it is million. There are more Nepalese than there are Indians, and they run Indian restaurants. Go to an Indian restaurant, they're doing the work in the back. <laughs> so there's this idea we're going to bring in these high-level people. Look at nurses. We're going to bring in nurses and a aged health care. What, what do they call them? Uh, the people that take care of old people. Kaigo. 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 Kaigo Kaigo OK. But who actually has come? Nurses, Filipino nurses are not coming here. First of all, the government is requiring that they pass a, a medical test in Japanese. Japanese. Medical Japanese is hard. Medicine's hard enough in English with all these Latin stuff. When you do it in Japanese, it's all that much more difficult. It's almost impossibly hard for a nurse to do that. But to be honest, if you were a Filipino nurse, why would you come to Japan? Right? It doesn't pay anywhere near as well as places where you could speak English and make a lot more money. The reality is Japan is not attractive at the high end. So I think there's a real tension here. Japan sees itself as a very desirable place, but in fact, there's competition for the most desirable places. I have doubts as to whether the US is going to start losing people. My, my, my son lives in Las Vegas. If you read yesterday's newspaper, that's like America writ large, another horrific, horrific event, and the way the United States is treating immigrants, at, at, even at the airports these days. Oshima-san said he hasn't had a problem. Has anybody else had problems at the airport where they're treating you nastily these days? I've heard that. I don't know how, how common that is. Even Japanese are saying they're treated really quite badly, or at least some. I don't know how common that is. Anyway, there's a competition for the actual jinzai, the people you really want, a lot of competition. I'm skeptical of Japan, not because it's a bad place, but because it's an unusual place. Japanese, in particular, is just a huge barrier to most foreigners. So I think the reality is we're going to be, if you look at, for example, the, um, the immigration, not immigration, excuse me, take that, take that, I didn't say that, I'm sorry, I didn't say that, not immigration. The, the categories for nuclear economy, they call it, right? Control of people coming into the country. Jet, Thai chefs and Thai masseuses are now considered skilled. So that's a way of, of taking the unskilled or semi-skilled and making them skilled. That's going on, and they will come to, to Japan, but not at the top end. And I'm skeptical that the Japanese government's going to really, and Japanese society will be really comfortable with opening up that much at the bottom end. So my prediction is what you're going to see is a slow decline. The problem is, and if you look at this, this upcoming election, basically what Abe and his opponents are all saying is, OK, we'll raise the shohize, right? we're going to increase it from 8% 8, 8 up to 10%, and then we're going to spend all the money. So it's not going to relieve the budget deficit. If you look at the Japanese budget, one quarter of it is now being spent to pay back the debt. That's at zero, essentially 0% 0 interest rates. So if interest rates go up at all, there's a lot of pressure. Even if interest rates don't go up, every year as Japan ages, there's more and more pressure on the budget. Sooner or later, something's going to have to give. Things are giving, but it's going to have to give more and more and more. There's going to be a lot of tension over that. But will that lead to a fundamental change, bringing in 1,000, a million, 10 million immigrants? You'd have to bring in a lot of immigrants to matter economically. I'm not a demographer. That's another thing I'm not a specialist for. But what I understand from demographers is it's not enough to bring in a million or two million, because they start getting older and, having, and, and getting used to Japanese society. They'll have few kids. You have to keep bringing in a million a year, every year, for forever. That's a, that's a big deal. Is Japan really going to do that? And if such people did come in, would they be able to adapt to Japanese society, or would they become a, a race, racially defined lower class? That's a real problem. I put two non-Japanese speaking kids through Japanese public schools. I have personal experience with this. My kids learned new Chinese, so they, they knew Chinese characters. They were in a much better position, and it was still hard. You bring in kids that don't know Chinese characters, don't speak Japanese, unless they come in at first grade or second grade, they're screwed. And Japanese schools, as I understand it, I don't have personal experience now. My kids are growing up. But as I understand it, they're making much more, much better efforts to help immigrant kids. So I think things are looking up. But it's a very difficult task. And it's quite possible you could see the creation of a racially or ethnically based underclass. And I think most Japanese, understandably, don't want that. So for what it's worth, my response to Japanese is you want to bring in more people, be prepared to spend a fair amount of money and to become a little bit more flexible. If you are not willing to do that, don't bring them in. But don't bring in them in, treat them like crap, and then watch them become an underclass. Not that anybody asked my opinion. <laughs> I have a, um, I thank you for your presentation. I basically agree with what you said.
but uh, uh, I'd like you to explore a little bit more, elaborate more about the you know, neoliberalism. Uh, uh, you, you said that the other is more neoliberalism you know, than populism. I see a little bit more populist element in Abe, because uh, uh, yes, he might embrace certain aspects of uh, international things like TPP and alliance with the US when it's convenient for Japan, but not all of it, because for example, when you push through the conspiracy bill, bill uh, one researcher assigned by UN High Commission refugees, criticized it, saying that it's a violation of our privacy, but you know, the government any attention. So I'm not, I'm a little bit skeptical about his uh, international idea. And in, uh, also the fact that the uh, deputy prime minister loves to comment about the, uh, you know, Nazism. He has something fascinating about it. And the second thing is that uh, Abe himself is a very kind of expansionist in terms of budget. You know, he learned in a hard way, I think, from my serving a post administration at that people are tired of uh, suing the government and cutting budget. So, you know, he, plugged, he grudgingly agreed to extend the uh, uh, raising sales tax in 2019. But it, you know, he, I think he actually, as long as he's in power, he wants to extend, extend, and now he has more of an expansion of the plan. So how do you see Abe in terms of this uh, neoliberalism, which I don't completely agree with? Good question. Um, actually, the longer Abe is prime minister, the more interesting I find him. Because all the criticisms have, people have of Abe seem to be true, but, but that's not the whole story. He's, he's actually quite complicated. And I find the contrast between Abe 1, where he was a complete failure, and Abe 2 to be really interesting. And is that just Suga? Uh, or is it Abe? It has to some extent, it's got to be Abe himself. And he, that's just a, sort of an aside. I find Abe really interesting. And frankly, I don't understand him. I haven't, I haven't read like a, an overall story, which this sort of brings together all these different aspects of Abe in a coherent whole. I, I, don't, I don't think I really understand him. About the link with, with neoliberalism, from the perspective that I've been giving of this discursive treatment of populism where you, you create a pure, you set off rhetorically a pure populist versus an evil, corrupt, elite establishment, the link with neoliberalism in Latin America was a little bit more clear. So basically you say big business and the state are in cahoots, Rich people are better able to use the state, and so market discipline will actually work to the benefit of the majority of people because they're the ones who've been excluded. That made a certain amount of sense in Latin America at the time, although that didn't last too long because people saw the downsides of that as well. But in other places, it doesn't work as well. In, in, if you look at, at Europe, I mean, I'm generalizing here. Well, France, Robert can correct me on anything I get wrong. The, uh, the retirement rate re age was quite low. Public servants were treated very well. Uh, the state, uh, the expenditures, state expenditures, expenditures over GDP were very high. So there was again a certain logic to saying that the people who are on the inside are uh, are d at sort of being privileged at the expense of all the rest of us in the private sector on the outside. The problem that in the French case is precisely because the state was so big. That was a lot of people. So when you try to set off the the vast the 99 percent versus the one percent, it wasn't one percent. It's 10 or 15, 20 percent or 30 percent. A lot of people benefit in Italy too. People used to retire at 50 in Italy and Greece. I mean, give, give me a break. But Japan, as I tried to suggest, is really not like that. When people say. Uh, bureaucrats are so cushy, are treated so cushily in Japan. Objectively speaking, it's just not true. And even subjectively, I think a lot of anybody who knows anything about the bureaucracy knows Japan does not have a huge bureaucracy. By and large, they're not paid a huge amount of money. I was talking to, to somebody who works in one of the consulates just the other day. She said when she goes to Geneva for meetings, the the all the time spent traveling there. I said, so do you get overtime pay for doing that? No, no, we get half time pay. So you, you, you do all this work, work like a maniac, and they pay you half salary for the, all the time you spend doing that. Uh, and is, is, and the, percent, the number of, of uh, public sector workers per 10,000 is like half of what it is in Germany or the US. So I don't think that there, and if you look at the inequality and, the, and sort of this perception that rich people have huge incomes, it's near, much, much smaller in Japan. So the rhetoric that would say, there's an establishment that's corrupt, that's using the government, we need to use market discipline against them, is not as convincing in Japan as it is in a lot of other countries. So I'm fairly skeptical. Koizumi did try to do that, and he was pretty successful. But to some extent, he plucked some of the low-hanging fruit. The LDP is less clientelistic than it used to be. 
Now, you could argue that's more about the long-term changes in the electoral system of the lower house and in the structure of the prime minister's office and all that. We could argue about who did it. But anyway, under Koizumi, there was a, a brief, somewhat neoliberal period, and it eliminated or reduced some of this. I think, I think the room to do that in Japan today is fairly limited. Very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to ask one question about the uh, final point, which is the um, the, the, uh, the uh, Japanese pop populism is unlikely to be difficult for three points. But I'm just wondering whether the uh, second point, which is the stable economy, is sustainable as you briefly referred. Um, because the um, so far, the Japanese budgetary system is uh, having a huge debt and the, the, the growing concern among specialists that the system is not sustainable any long as now later the, uh, the, some kind of crisis could happen, for instance. Uh, if that happens, the stable economy will disappear permanently or for actually one, one or two decades. And if the stable economy is gone, what about the social integration? At this moment, the public, the public distrust to the uh, government and the public sectors are uh, strong for, I would say, from since 1980s or so, right? So the, the public trust to the government is much lower than the, the, the counterpart in Europe or probably the, uh, even America. So in that case, so in that way, the, uh, the condition of Japan is not as stable as, as it seems now in the future. It's very likely. And if that happens, the, I think the, um, the uh, political situation Japan will be very different and could be potential to um, have more populism, I think. Maybe. I, as I said, who knows the future. Um, but my guess, as I suggested in my earlier comments, I'm a, I think that's probably less likely. Why? I think it's more likely Japan will sort of slowly, gracefully decline than that it will really collapse. For one thing, if you look at expenditures and tax revenues, what's striking about Japan and, and Europe is how much lower both of those are. So there's a gap, but if Japanese spent as much in taxes as Europeans did, they would have enough to pay for all this stuff. It's a political choice. Now you could argue that increasing tax rates is counterproductive in terms of economic productivity. Actually, if you follow the literature on taxation, depends on who you believe, it's highly ideological. My guess is that below quite high rates of taxation, it wouldn't have huge effects. So basically, the J Japan has made a political, Japan collectively, the LDP, has made a political choice not to tax Japan too heavily. If the population continues to get older and the kinds of pressures you're talking about continue to, to, to mount, the, my suspicion is what they'll do is they'll raise taxes. And people will grumble, and, and it may even decrease growth rates somewhat, but basically they'll grumble and complain, but things will, they'll spend more and, and gradually get used to higher taxes. I don't have the data, and I, in fact, I don't think I ever wrote them down, but I came across data, so just trust me, trust me. Uh, showing expectations and comparing that with uh, income levels. And what's really striking is adaptive expectations. So as Japan has grown slower and slower, Japanese people, especially young people, they don't expect much. Expectations have gone down fairly slowly, uh, very, fairly slowly but steadily over a 20, 30 year period. So you're assuming that people expect things are going to be good, and then they're not. I expect that people don't have very high expectations, and reality will, will, will prove true. That's in true justified, but that it will be a slow decline. That's my guess. But you could be right. It depends on how. Is there going to be a shock? If it happens suddenly, and all of a sudden, your grandmother is not receiving her pension, or people can't afford medical care, that's, that's different. But if you get a slow decline, which I suspect is more likely, uh, maybe not. Maybe you don't get a big populist response. I think an anti-Chinese, anti-Korean anger is more likely than a huge split within Japan. That's my yeah, guess. For instance, if the economy is in get unstable, the foreign investment, such as the Chinese investment, significantly increase. Oh yeah, I do think Chinese investment will be a blinking red light. And at some level, China's a huge economy. It's getting more sophisticated. It's opening up. It, it's perfectly natural for the Chinese to want to invest more. But of course, China is not like everybody else. And the Communist Party controls things. And you don't have complete symmetry. And that's creating a lot of, of, a lot of frustration. So I think that would be a trigger. Chinese investment is going to be tricky. Uh, there, there are lots of other people. Um, well, uh, on October 22nd, we have the uh, uh, Senate election. And I would like your personal opinion. Which party will win? <laughs> <laughs> I overheard. 
I overheard Kenneth talking, I th or I think somebody behind me, saying, you read the newspapers, and it's, it's both fascinating and hopeless because things change every day. <laughs> the honest answer is, hell if I know. But I would say that I'm a little bit worried, with, uh, worried but also interested. At the moment, there seems to be a real split between politicians and the public. The politicians are all moving to the right. So far, at least, public opinion is much less aggressive than the politicians are. So what's going to happen? One possibility is that Edano and the Communist Party will do surprisingly well. That may happen. Another possibility is that the populace will take cues from their political leaders. As the left declines, they'll take clues from whoever's out there. And if they're all right-wingers, then the public will move to the right. And of course, that's also possibly linked to, a, to possibly an increased perception of threat from North Korea and China. That's another big possibility. Or it's possible that politicians will discover they've gone too far. To some extent, Abe has made that discovery. He would like to do things the public just has not wanted, and he's had to pull back. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm also looking with great interest to this election. Thank you. Um, Robert? Uh, great. Thanks a lot. Oh, it's really fascinating. You know, you mentioned the attitude towards Korea, saying, well, China is too big, we can't do anything about it, Korea, we can. But if we look at how the government has responded to both North Korea and South Korea, it's actually fairly soft. I mean, the rhetoric against North Korea coming from Tokyo is the same. Well, it's unacceptable. It's been acceptable for a long time. There have been absolutely no threats. It's been fairly soft compared to what North Korea actually threatens Japan uh, with. And again, South Korea, you know, I mean, Abe did sign the deal on the sex slaves. Not a perfect deal, but from his point of view, it was really quite something. I mean, it, and you know, it, he's expressed an intro, he met with uh, the South Korean president uh, in New York. Uh, even if you look at this aspect of quote unquote not populism, let's say right wing nationalism, uh, what's striking in Japan, if you compare it, I mean, I won't even mention Trump, uh, but a lot of other countries, it's really how, how soft, how moderate, how reasonable it is. Um, yes and no. I, I, I largely mm. agree with mm. that. But j the Japanese, and, and mm. the Japanese government has kind of, or the Abe mm. government has kind of mm. gone back and forth, so mm. there are different mm. signs. Mm. I was very struck by the, the way the Japanese government under Abe went after cities that put in mm. uh, support for the comfort mm. women. So which one was it in LA? It was uh, Glendale, Glendale, yeah. Glendale uh, and some others. Mm. That, if you think of, of politics as a matter of coalitions and agenda mm. setting, if those mm. are kind of the big things in politics, in terms of agenda setting, what you want to do is keep this off the agenda. Yeah. You don't want to keep fighting it because to fight is to lose. Mm. So when intelligent Japanese bureaucrats do objectively stupid things, you have to wonder. There's something funny going on. And going after academics and journalists and pissing the hell out of people who were originally on your side, that to me was really counterproductive and suggested something almost irrational or something very strange. But mm. that has not been consistent. They've kind of gone back mm. and forth on mm. that. The deal with the, the statue in front of the, I guess, is it the, it's not the embassy, is it the embassy or the, the consulate? Both. Both, Both yeah. yeah. Um, the smart thing mm. to do is just to be shut up. Mm. There's no need to keep it on the agenda. You can be unhappy mm. about it and mm. pissed off about it and just ignore it. But to make it an issue is counterproductive. So the Japanese mm. government has done different things. And as I said, I, as I said about Abe, I think you could say the same thing mm. about policy towards Korea. I find it kind of puzzling. It seems to mm. shift around a bit. For what it's worth, small n, mm. not even research, mm. just living in Tokyo, mm. talking to Japanese bureaucrats, I have been struck by people in certain ministries which shall name, whose names will go nameless at the sense of a kind of personal outrage and disdain mm. that I've heard about Korea. People are pissed. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but I think it's, as you say, it's, it's not a clear line. Uh, no, it's not that clear, and, and not that stable. Yeah, and I think. probably, I think, in other countries, given what's happening in Korea, you could have expected even worse. Uh, but thanks, I think it was very convincing. Uh, other questions? Uh, This gets back to your analysis of the labor market. Is there any way that uh, research could swing towards a more careful look at the demographic between age 60 and 75? I've got a front row seat on it. Um, and nobody wants to retire in the same way there is a hunger for retirement 
in all of the Western countries. They don't want to retire. In the, they don't mind changing jobs, they don't mind changing positions, they don't mind changing hours, but they don't want to retire in that Western sense. And they're going for consultants, contract employees, shoktaku, uh, haken, lots of self-employed consultants up one side and down the other, small businesses. Um, and perhaps that is going to be the buffer for the labor shortage. I mean, if you don't have a college education and a great career behind you, you become a taxi driver. You find a farm where the guy is 80 and you can help him out because you're only 70 <laughs> type of thing. And you can keep it going. Um, and meanwhile, with this increased involvement of the older people in the workforce, the younger people have fairly good expectations. I'm seeing a lot more little kids in my neighborhood Well, For whatever that it's worth. But, that will be but worth the, following. The, the push of not wanting to retire and the pull of the stinginess of the retirement benefits, I think, is, is makes that a segment that is worth studying. Um, I agree. For what it's worth, this is the 10th topic I'm not mm. an expert on. Um, you're right. And it's conceivable, I think, that labor force participation rates already very high in comparative perspective among Japanese older people could probably go up even higher. I think that's yeah. true. That could help alle alleviate the problem. If you think of the, the labor market more generally, when do workers have the most leverage? They have the most leverage at the beginning. That's one reason I think young people are unlikely to be too radicalized, because they're the ones that businesses want. So basically, younger people are going to be in the catbird seat. Older people are not. So they're still going to be treated rather shabbily. But as you say, people still want to work. So I think businesses will probably have to reluctantly give in a little bit, treat older people a little bit better. And old people do want to work. And you're, I think the scenario you're talking about is very possible. But I don't think they're going to get great. I don't, I don't see them getting regular jobs or even decent jobs. I think there's going to be a kind of an accommodation in the middle and, and in the higher w end of the ages. And people at the younger end are the ones that are really going to benefit from the labor market. I haven't seen the antagonism between age groups about the old people do this and they don't let us do that. They get along better. I'm not talking about interpersonal Here. relations, but if no, you're... But that, that softens the younger people's attitude. Also, there's a, one of the big uh, stock trading companies has done away with um, retirement age for their salesmen. They can work as long as they want and can bring in business. Right, but sales is an unusual... Yeah. I mean, some jobs are more amenable to a sort of piecework approach. Yeah. You, you, you eat what you kill, that kind of approach. The sales is the classic one. Yeah. So it's, it's, for them to say that doesn't say that much because they weren't treating salesmen particularly well before. It was much more of an open market kind of approach than in many other occupations. But the idea that the Dankai no Sedai is retiring, 64, phew, they disappear. I think you need to look at oh, where that's they're true. disappearing. Too. Absolutely. And, and I would say the same thing about China, by the way. Oh, the Chinese are going to have this terrible problem. Well, there's a lot of room to expand the, the, uh, the, the retirement age. But as someone who's entering that era myself, are they going to treat us as well as they treated us in the middle of our career? No. That's not going to change, I don't think. Um, I think we're kind of running out of time, so. Yeah, Henry, I, I a like familiar looking face? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I'm also a student. Uh, today. Uh, I, would, I would just want to return to the question of the left wing uh, and you said that in this election there is a gap between the, the attitude of the public and of the, the elite, which of course is absolutely true, I think, but this gap it seems to me has, has existed for quite a while and is, I know you can see like maybe the popular frustration with that be, be due to the, the number of, uh, the percentage of people that say they don't support any party, they feel that nobody supports them and in my, my suspicion is that a lot of them are mainstream left-wing left -wing voters who just don't have a party anymore. And so, like, if you look at that, that phenomenon, how, does it, how has it uh, impacted the Japanese politics since, you know, the end, I guess, the end of the Cold War? L let me give you my stock answer that Kenneth is actually a better, better put to analyze. But what I would say is the Japanese, not electoral system, but systems, because there are several of them and they interact, and Ken can tell me more about a lot of that too. My take on this, 
is that the fact that the electoral system has some room for smaller parties has fatally undermined the, the biggest liberal party. In particular, the Kuomeito and the Kyosanto are the enemies of a united left. And they have niches that they're not going to give up. And as long as they're there, there goes most of the support. So people say the, the Minshito or the Minshinto or whatever the hell it's going to come, become in the future, or whatever these new parties are, they're weak, they're ineffective. But partly that's because they don't have much space to, to grow. And there was, there was a lot of talk about Maurice Duverger and Duverger's law. And put, people put, put too much emphasis on the, on the fact that there, was, there were a large majority of single member district seats in the lower house. But even in the lower house, it's not all single member districts. And we add the upper house and local elections. It's a much more complicated and the, the dual candidacy provisions. Basically, it means that we're not pushing towards a two-party two, uh, system. And what really looks like is happening is that this is a system that's very good for the biggest party and then splits up the smaller parties. But you know, the, there are tensions on the right. So now, is the LDP going to split up? I, I don't know. Uh, having the party name, the history, the, the, uh, the funding from the government is a very powerful incentive not to give up the LDP. So I guess. I'm a little skeptical that the left is going to be able to get its act together because the combination of this kind of this combination of electoral systems plus the fact that finance is centrally determined, so there's a huge incentive to, to control the central government, means that the LDP is still in a very advantageous position. And so, I mean, certainly voters and, and politicians that represent them can have different opinions for a very long time. Sometimes the voters are unrealistic. They want a better services for lower taxes. And it's not always realistic. That's one reason why voters and and their representatives have different opinions. Sometimes voters have a general sense, but then they're, they're quite divided about the specifics. That's and changing the Constitution. So again, I'm cautious, and I tend to see a lot of continuity. I don't see the left getting its act together in the near future. So there, this gap could continue. Um, Mason Hester from the Beasley School of Law. Uh, thank you. And I understand the topic or the title of your speech is you know, the susceptibility of Japan to populism, and that seems to imply that it's not suffering from populism. But I recall 10, 15 years ago when generally East Asia was referred to as suffering from an influence of Confucian ideals, and that the, the popu populist would go along with uh, whatever the, the elites say. Well, why do you begin by defining populism as representing some antipathy towards the elites, be they right or leftist, uh, why couldn't it be what I used to hear Japan, or how I used to hear Japan be defined, and how I still find it is this uh, relative surprising amount of apathy and ambivalence toward the political or religious spheres. Uh, you spoke about it's how it's hard to judge people as to classifications and to religious uh, groups and predict them. Uh, an anecdote a week ago, a, a, a gentleman 40 years old or so, uh, when I asked him about his Shogatsu uh, yearly visit to the shrine or temple, I asked him where does he go, he told me he honestly couldn't tell the difference between a shrine or a temple. Uh, the willingness to go along and get along in China, Korea, and Japan uh, is, seems to be an ever-present populism, but now we're seeming to term populism as something that has to be active or reactionary. Why couldn't it be this ambivalence and apathy and lethargy? Words mean what we make of them. But the general literature on populism in politics is along the lines that I've suggested. And it's not based on Japan. In fact, Japan is a case that's almost never mentioned. So the general way that political scientists and most political commentators talk about populism is along the lines that I've been talking about. Now, some emphasize the, the ideological side more, the, the discursive side more. That's what I've done tonight. Others frame it more in terms of a, of a movement or a party or an entrepreneurial politician. There are different ways to cut at it, but this is the traditional way. So I think what you're talking, to put it bluntly, I think what you're talking about is probably best discussed under another term. Most people don't use the term populism to talk about what you're talking about. I mean, isn't, and I don't mean to drag this out, but by bare bones, isn't populism the, the movement of the population, the, and uh, instinctively a majority of the population, by just stripping the etymology of the word? So wouldn't, if the majority of the population, with voter turnout ever decreasing, and people switching from side to side, and uh, a stranglehold by the LDP on, on the political systems, isn't that Japanese populism in expressed, through, expressed through its apathy? Not as I'm defining it. 
You can define it your way, I'll define it my way. Okay, thank you. But I think the main thing is you should be clear about what system you're using. So this is, this is the framework from which I'm coming, this is how I'm defining it. All these words are used in many different ways. I'm just saying this is the tradition out of which I'm coming and this is how I've defined it. Thank you. We, uh, Kenneth and I have a class and we mentioned the term essentially contested concepts. There are a lot of those in politics. A lot of them where the very concepts are highly, themselves are highly contested. It doesn't mean anybody's right or wrong, but you have to be clear about what you're talking about. Thanks for your talk. Uh, my name is Daniel Hurst. I'm a freelance ah. journalist. Um, uh, we emailed before. Um, I just wanted to take you back to, to Governor Koike. Um, I know you said she seems to be uh, looking more at opportunistic politics than um, populism per se, but um, she is sort of um, building an image for herself as sort of taking on vested interests, standing up for the people against this um, establishment. Um, and at the same time, there have been a few things that have been interpreted as dog whistles um, in the last year about uh, in terms of treatment towards Korean school in Tokyo and also recently not sending specific tributes for the um, massacre victims, Korean massacre victims. Now, I'm not saying that's central to her message, but that they are there. So would you say there's some elements of populism, even if you wouldn't call her a populist as such? I, I'm just interested if you could explore that a bit more. Good question. I think the honest answer is um, I'm not an expert on Koike, and this is all rather new. I think the, this, the simple answer is follow this station. My suspicion is that she is indeed an opportunist. Probably her personal beliefs are not that important to her, but to the extent she has them, they're probably fairly conservative. And so the question is, is, is really very interesting. To what extent will she see this as a viable strategy? I hadn't heard about the, 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 the dog whistles that you mentioned. I didn't, hadn't read about those. Um, so those, those would <coughs> suggest that she might be moving in that direction. So to what extent will she do that? To what extent will this prove to be a successful strategy? Uh, Trump found that he could, didn't he have this famous comment about I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and get away with it? He, he pushed a particular approach and found that it worked at least with enough people to get him the presidency. Uh, and she may find that too. I, all I'm saying is that so far, as far as I know, and my knowledge is limited, her message has been, she said a lot of different things and they seem to go in somewhat different directions. But you may be right that she's, she will find this a, uh, a successful direction. We'll see. Well, thanks very much. We've almost reached uh, the end of the session, so th thanks a lot, Greg. You know, I'm interested, do you think there's a time in Japanese history, I mean, in, in, in post-Meiji history, where you could talk of a populist movement, of well, a powerful one? Well, to some extent, you had one in the pre-war period. Mm. You had a, 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 a cultural mm. backlash in mm. the countryside mm. against the Zaibatsu, mm. against the perception mm. that the Zaibatsu were in mm. the back, the parties were in mm. the back pockets of the Zaibatsu. Mm a strong sense of, diff of different values, mm. a cosmopolitanism mm. versus nativism. Yeah, mm. I think you mm. can talk about mm. populism in the pre-war period. Mm. Yeah, though of course there it ended up with that the elite is. running the show. That's that, that, I mean, that's a, that's yeah. a long story. So yeah, that's a long story. Well, thanks again. Thank you all for, for coming. I'd like to thank Greg.